Matthew chapter number 27. I want to begin in verse number 15, and we'll read all the way down to verse number uh, 24. Uh, Matthew 27, verse 15 through verse number 24. Let's all stand in honor of the reading of God's word. The Bible says here in Matthew 27, Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a riot was, riot was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. You may be seated. Father, we come today in Jesus' name, and we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to come to worship. Uh, to pray together, to sing, to encourage each other uh, in the faith and in the word of God. And Father, we thank you for all those who are here this morning that you'll let your blessings be upon us as we learn together. And I want to pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit that he will speak to us, teach us things that we could learn and know no other way. And I pray that you'll raise up uh, from us those who are willing to share the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and help others to see the hope of forgiveness in him. And Father, we just pray for those that might be listening today who've never accepted you as their personal Savior. I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will become up upon them very strong, that they'll understand their lostness and their hopelessness without you, and that they'll pause and they'll pray and ask you to be their Savior. I ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. In Matthew's, chapter, uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 27, it records the story of the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It was witnessed by a large number of people as we read uh, throughout the book of Matthew chapter number 27. And during this time, it was the Passover season and they were large crowds who had gathered uh, in Jerusalem to celebrate that. Well, Matthew records for us what many of those who witnessed the uh, crucifixion, he records for us what they felt about it. He records for us what they decided to do about what they saw. And when we read in Matthew chapter number 27, we discover that the chief priest and the elders, they've already plotted to put Jesus Christ to death. Notice in verse number 1 of chapter number 27, it says, When morning came, all the chief priests and the elder, elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. Of uh, these high-ranking religious leaders, uh, they were in opposition to Jesus because in their self-righteousness, they just felt they really didn't need Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus was getting in the way of the way they liked to do things, and they were self-sufficient, and they were confident in their religious system, and they really didn't need him. And you know something, when we think about it today, they represent all those who feel like they are good enough to get into heaven, uh, that they're good enough to live their lives apart from our Lord, and they have no need for him, and they have no desire to know him. But the truth is today, you and I know that everybody needs Jesus. Amen. The Bible says in the book of Romans in chapter number 3, in verse number 23, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says in the book of Romans in chapter number 3 and verse number 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
People don't need a religion. They need a relationship. And God has demonstrated his love for us by sending his son to die for us on the cross. And this demonstration of love, it opens the doorway for us to enter into a wonderful relationship with God. And that's what love is. Love is a relationship. If you'll remember, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, in verse number 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God in him. Everyone needs Jesus. It's not a religion but faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that brings you into a relationship with God and that relationship, it will change the way you live. When you have a real relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, it's going to not only change who you are, but it'll change who, how you live. The Bible tells us that your desire will no longer be to live for yourself, but now you have a new desire and that new desire is to live for God. Paul put it in a wonderful way, didn't he? In the book of Galatians, in chapter 2, in verse number 20, he writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live in, I, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. Christ lives in me. Now that's a wonderful relationship that we all should be excited about and a relationship that we all enjoy. But in the book of Matthew in chapter number 27, the scene is around the cross. And if you read this somewhat lengthy chapter, you'll find that there's a lot of people. And there's a lot of people who are looking on and they're making comments and they're making decisions about what they see happening that day. And Matthew, he, he talks about them and he points out a lot of things that really get our attention in this passage. For example, uh, the Bible teaches us that Pilate, the governor, he refused the Lord Jesus that day. Did you notice what it says in Matthew chapter number 27 and verse number 2? It says, and when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate the governor. But notice what it says in verse number 11. Now when Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priest and the elders, he answered them nothing. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him, not one word. And so the governor marveled greatly. In verse number 19, it says, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. And so we look today at Pilate, and we think about what a moment this is for Pilate. And sometimes we just kind of read past this without really thinking it through. But we see here Pilate, uh, he is standing face to face, with Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, who is on his way to the cross to die for all of the sins of the world and to die also for the sins of Pilate. What a moment it was for Pilate to be standing in the very presence of the Lord. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, it is as you say. He answered Pilate's question. The truth is, Jesus was more than just the king of the Jews. He was the son of God, the savior of the world. And he's standing there in the presence of Pilate. And although he marveled greatly, he refused the opportunity to bow before Jesus and say, have mercy on me, a sinner. What a moment this man met. And I want to ask you something. How close can anybody be to Jesus and still say no to the Lord? Even his wife comes and warns him to have nothing to do with that just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. With all of that, Pilate still moves forward with the sentence to crucify our Lord. All of this happened. 
as Jesus was preparing to go to the cross to pay the sin debt for your sin and mine so that we might have forgiveness. The Bible says in verse 24 of Matthew 27, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail but uh, all, at, at all, but rather that a riot was rising, he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude and said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person you see to it. When Pilate refused to say yes to the Lord, he really said no to the Lord because there's no middle ground. Jesus himself said, you are either for me or you are against me. And listen, it did Pilate no good to wash his hands because the problem was really in his heart. Pilate refused Jesus as he stood in the presence of our Lord. What a moment Pilate had. And what a moment Pilate missed as he stood before the Lord. Now, second of all, we see in Matthew chapter number 27, another very familiar personality as it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ and his crucifixion, and that is Judas. Judas, for 30 pieces of silver, he betrayed Jesus. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 27, in verse 3 through 4, it says, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned and was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Judas felt guilty of what he had done. However, this was not enough to cause him to genuinely repent of what he had done. His sorrow did not lead him to genuinely repent of the Lord. He went back to the chief priest and he confessed to them what he had done, but he never went to Jesus Christ and confessed to him what he had done. We see in this passage, Pilate, and the role he played in the crucifixion of our Lord. And we see Judas and the role he played in the crucifixion of our Lord. But then notice also in verse number 15, Barabbas is released because of Jesus. I want to tell you something. We look at the moment that Pilate had before the Lord, but think about the moment that Barabbas had before the Lord. Did you notice in verse number 15? It says, now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they uh, wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For they knew they had handed him over because of envy. And notice in verse number 20, but the chief priest and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to him, which of the two do you want me to release? They said Barabbas. Pilate said to him, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why, what evil has he done? But they cried all the more, saying, let him be crucified. They released Barabbas, and Jesus died in his place. But when you and I begin to think about it today, we should not forget that Jesus Christ also died in our place. He not only took the place that Barabbas deserved to be on the cross, but he also took the place that we should have been on the cross. He died for us so that our sins could be forgiven. And sometimes we forget about that the cross was as much about us as it was about Barabbas. That he was dying for us as well as he was dying for the rest of the world. But then also in Matthew chapter 27, in verse number 27, you see the soldiers. They mocked Jesus. 
Matthew records. It says then the soldiers of the governor, they took Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered the whole garrison together uh, around him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Even today, Jesus is mocked at uh, and laughed at by many. Many refuse to believe anything that the Bible says about the Lord. It's all humorous to a lot of people. But listen, speaking of Jesus, the Bible says in the book of Matthew, or excuse me, in the book of Philippians chapter number 2, in verse number 8, it says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so the soldiers, they mock, but the world will come to a place where they will not mock, but they'll give the Lord Jesus Christ glory and praise because he is our resurrected Lord as well as our soon coming King, the Bible says. All of these that we read about in Matthew chapter number 27, they had a choice. They watched the crucifixion of our Lord. They witnessed all of these events. They had a choice. They could mock the Lord Jesus or they could bow before him in worship and give their lives to him. They had a choice. People today also have a choice. Over the next several weeks, there'll be a lot of preaching in pulpits all across our country today about the death of Jesus Christ and later the resurrection of our Lord. And it will give an opportunity for people to do uh, what they need to do to accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior. But the question is, what will you do with Jesus? The soldiers, they mocked the Lord as he was preparing to die for their sins on the cross. But also, in verse number 32, there is another character in this uh, account written by Matthew, and it's Simon of Serene. He carried the cross for Jesus. In verse number 32, it says this, now as they came out, they found a man of Serene, Simon by name. Him they, compare, uh, they compelled to bear his cross. And we know what's going on here, this passage of scripture. Jesus that night before, he had been up all night. He had been beaten. He had been humiliated. He had been laughed at. He had been scorned, and as Jesus carried his cross toward Golgotha, he began to stumble, and it was likely that he wasn't going to be able to make it to that site of crucifixion. And time was pressing for them because the Passover season was approaching, and they needed to get this crucifixion over with as quickly as they could. Seems that one of the soldiers looked, and there was a man named Simon for, from Serene, and he must have just reached over and tapped him on the shoulder and give him the instruction to carry the cross for Jesus. And again, you know, there's a lot of times we look at this and we don't really think it through and think this, what this man is fixing to do. But the Bible, it tells us that he carried that cross to the Golgotha's hill, the place of the skull where Jesus Christ would give his life for the sins of the world. Mark in his gospel, he tells us a little bit more about this. In the book of Mark in chapter number 15 and verse number 21, it says, Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian. And notice this, it, Mark tells us he was the father of Alexander and also Rufus. As he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And later on, 
Paul in the book of Romans wrote about Rufus, the son of Simon. And listen to what Paul wrote about him in 16 of Romans, verse number 13. It says, greet Rufus, chosen of the Lord. Listen, it is very likely that Rufus became a believer, a follower in the Lord Jesus Christ because of the testimony of his father, Simon. Can you imagine what would have happened when Simon got home that day? And Mrs. Simon would have asked her husband, how was your day today? He would have had quite a story to tell, wouldn't he? To tell, well, you know, I was passing through Jerusalem, and there was a crucifixion in process. It, they was on their journey to the hill of Golgotha, and I was appointed to carry the cross of one of those that was being executed. And I believe that Simon would have described this in great detail to his family. And they would have been listening on. And he would have described all the events that went on around the crucifixion. The, the quaking of the earth and the darkness that covered the land for three hours. And, uh, and the things that were happening around the cross. And to the point that in all likelihood, not only did he receive the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior, but also his family. Simon carried the cross for Jesus. And what raises the question this morning for us is this, what are we doing for the Lord? Simon carried the cross for Jesus. He had been up all night. He had been beaten. He was struggling to make it to that place to give his life for the sins of the world. And so Simon carried that cross. Listen, that should remind us how important it is as people of faith for us. We should get involved and not just sit around and wait on somebody else to do it. So we see Simon. We see the soldiers. We see Pilate. We see Judas, but also if you'll notice in Matthew's gospel, there is some others to focus on. The Bible says the robbers joined others in mocking Jesus. In one of the gospels, the two guys that were crucified, one on one side of Jesus and the other on the other side of Jesus, they're called thieves. And when we look at this passage of Scripture, Matthew records them as simply being robbers. And notice what he says in verse number 24, uh, in verse number 44 of Matthew's gospel, chapter number 27. He points out that the robbers, they joined everybody else in mocking Jesus. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with them. Here's the sad scene. The chief priest, the scribes, and the elders, they all mocked Jesus. Did you hear what they said? It says in verse number 42, he saved others himself he cannot save. That's what the religious leaders were saying about Jesus. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. These all mock Jesus, which means they cast verbal insults at him. In Jerusalem, it was Passover season. Large crowds were in the city to celebrate the season. All of this would have gotten the attention of those large crowds and everybody was looking on as Jesus was making his way to Calvary to give his life for the sins of the world. And did you notice what it says in Matthew's Gospel 27, verse number 39? And those who passed by blasphemed him 
wagging their heads and saying, you who destroyed the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Multitudes of people, everybody shouting verbal insults at our Lord, laughing at him, mocking him, and what he was doing was going to pay the sin debt of the world so that we could have forgiveness. Listen, it was not that Jesus could not come down from the cross. It was that he would not come down from the cross. Listen, Jesus was more than just a good man. He was more than just a teacher. He was more than just a prophet. He is God in the flesh, and that's what made him worthy to pay the sin debt for us. Jesus did not come down from the cross because his purpose for coming into the world was to redeem the souls of lost mankind. In the book of Mark, in chapter number 10, in verse number 45, he records this. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Luke tells us some good news about the cross. He tells us in Luke 23 of his gospel that one of those who was crucified with Jesus recognized him and asked to be forgiven. The greatest thing that can ever happen to anybody is when they come to the realization that Jesus Christ is Savior, and that Jesus Christ is Lord. And when they ask him to forgive them of their sin and to be their Savior. And let me tell you something. Wouldn't you agree the thief on the cross, he was running out of time. He wasn't going to have a lot more opportunities, but the Lord in his grace and his goodness continued to knock on the heart's door of this man to the point that he recognized Jesus Christ and he asked for forgiveness and he repented of his sins. The Bible says in Luke's Gospel 23, then one of the criminals who, was, who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself. And us. But the other. But the other. Answering rebuked him saying. Do you not even fear God? He recognized who Jesus was. Seeing you are under the same condemnation. Uh, condemnation he recognized that he was a sinner. And we indeed justly, we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Let me tell you something, folks. This guy really got the message. Everybody else was mocking, and everybody else was making fun, and everybody else was just uh, doing all these evil things, but this man saw Jesus for who he was. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Those who reject Jesus as Savior also mock him just as all these did that day. Although there's a lot of people who reject the Lord today will tell you they are a good person. And what they're really saying is they really don't need Jesus. They are fine just the way they are. But also there's another personality around the cross, and it's the centurion. Did you notice that? In verse number 54 of Matthew 27, it says, So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Of God. Did you notice this scene? The centurion and those who were helping him guard Jesus. They were helping them. I, I mean, Jesus was on the cross. He was being crucified. 
And yet they were guarding him. Uh, what is this all about? Well, there have been many times when Jesus had escaped before. They might have thought that there's going to be some kind of last minute rescue here as well. And they would lose. They were guarding him. But listen, the centurion and those helping watch Jesus, they were close enough to the cross to hear Jesus talking to the Father. They were close enough to the cross to hear him talking to God and calling God his Father. They heard that. Listen, when we look in this passage of Scripture, they were close enough to hear him promise the thief who was, had repented, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Let me tell you something. They were close enough to see it all. They were close enough to hear it all. And they concluded, because of all the events that was going on around the cross, that there was something different about Jesus. These men around the cross, they were professional executioners. They'd seen people die before, but they'd never seen anybody die like Jesus. They'd never seen uh, total darkness over all the land for three hours. They never felt the earthquake the way that it did in that time. And so these things uh, was uh, pointing out that Jesus Christ was indeed the Son of God Amen. dying for the sins of the world. Truly this was the Son of God. That's what they concluded. But as you can imagine, they were the women. Matthew remembered that the women had followed Jesus as well. They went to the cross. In verse number 55 of Matthew 27, it says, And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. These ladies, they followed Jesus all the way to the cross. You know, ladies are amazing. They'll go the distance. They're the last ones to give up. They hang in there. And these, these ladies, you know, they had to be there. Listen, they had been near to Jesus in his life, and they were determined to stay with him in his death. Now, when we look at all these things, the scene of the cross and how sad it is and all the events that took place that day, what does all that mean to us Today, what does that have to do with right now? I believe today what that means to us is there's a decision that we have to make as it relates to Jesus Christ. What will you do with Jesus? Will you receive him or will you reject him? That's what this is all about today. The Bible teaches us that you must receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior. It's not just a story that we talk about this time of the year. It's a reality. It is something that supernaturally Jesus Christ has provided for us as he became our substitute on the cross. The Bible says in the book of John, in chapter number 1, in verse number 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. That was, the, that was true around the cross. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But here's the good news. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. And to those who believe in his name. What would you do with Jesus? What would you do with Jesus? Now, there's some today who would argue that you do not have to go to church to be a Christian. A lot of people, it's popular today for them to argue that way. But I want to remind you today that church was our Lord's idea. That was his idea. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not 
prevail against it. And Paul reminds husbands to love their wives. And how did he remind husbands to love their wives? He reminded husbands to love their wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave his life for it. Listen, Jesus did not build his church and give his life for his church and then turn around and say, well, it's really not that important whether you go or not. That's the argument that a lot of people make today. It's not important. It was important enough for Jesus to die for. The Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approach. That's what the Bible says. To receive Jesus is to love what Jesus loved. And to receive Jesus is to Um, love him and when we love him and love what he loves we will love his church you must receive Jesus Christ this is what this scene is all about what are you going to do we have looked at what many of them did around the cross but what will you do you have to receive Jesus Christ as Savior but second of all you should get to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You should get to know him. Listen at this loving invitation that our Lord gives in Matthew 11. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Getting to know Jesus through his word and learning to walk with him and witness for him and work for him is the most exciting and fulfilling thing you will ever experience. The message of the cross is not something that we should hear about and walk away from. It's not something we should hear about and forget. We must receive Jesus Christ as Savior and spend the rest of our lives getting to know him and serving him. And then last of all, you should yield your life to him day by day, moment by moment. Never leave him out of your life. Never dismiss him him from your thoughts. He loves you that much, and you should love him that much. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you've allowed us to be here to examine Matthew 27 at the different decisions that were made relating to the cross. We live in a world today that needs to look at the cross and decide what to do with Jesus. And Father, help us to be bold in our witness. Help us to have a deep love in our heart for those that need to know you. Help us to lovingly and prayerfully share the gospel with them. And lead them to Jesus so that he can forgive them of their sin. I ask this prayer in his name. Amen. Amen. So I'll stand together this morning.